minute before the official start of the AMA, but we've already got questions and people watching, so may as well begin. Uh, I've got myself set up with, uh, I'll be drinking some of my non-alcoholic uh, ales that, that we've found. Hopefully my wife and I will get to reviews, reviews of those in the coming month or so. Um, I do want to, uh, I'm going to address questions right away. I do want to say a few sort of ground rules. Um, nobody needs to ask the same question more than once because it's in the stream. Uh, doing so just clutters it up. I've answered questions about Peterson, Zizek, all these sort of pop philosophy figures many, many times. So I don't have an awful lot new to say about them. Uh, we do have some good questions over here. I will also say that I'm going to try to answer one question from a given person and then move on to somebody else. So if you write a whole bunch of questions, don't expect them all to get answered because, you know, this is sharing space. Already we got 22 people on here. There may be as many as 100 or 150. All right, so Ron James has a funny thing that he's saying here uh, in a response to what's up early people, nothing much, just waiting for juicy questions and even juicier answers from Dr. Sadler. I use the word salty for those kinds of answers. And it's interesting because I was having a conversation with my, my wife um, the other day. And she said, you know, most of the time when you're talking with um, you know, clients and reading groups and stuff like that, you seem like you're really having a great time. Um, it kind of goes back and forth with AMAs and political theory discussions. You know, you sound like you're, you're uh, irritated with some of the stuff. And, and you know. I thought about that a bit and I was like, well, you know, sometimes I actually am, you know, when people ask me the same question that I get asked month after month, um, that's kind of, you know, uh, bad form. But for the most part, um, I actually enjoy these quite a lot. So, uh, but I will get salty if people ask, there are dumb questions. <laughs> I'll put it to you that way. All right, uh, Galen, I'm not going to satisfy entirely. Can you give one or two examples of Greek and Roman philosophers who would be good for beginner intermediate and uh, advanced students of Greek and Latin to try to original? Probably not, because I'm not a, a um, classics guy, and I don't, I don't teach people how to read Greek and Latin. I can tell you what, what I did, and that might be helpful for you, although there are so many other authors out there who, like, I haven't read, and, and, or if I've read them, I haven't read them in the original. Let's take Latin. Um, Somebody who's really quite easy to read, but is not somebody in classics, would be Thomas Aquinas, right? The uh, language of the Summa and also his commentaries and a lot of the minor works is deliberately easy. I won't say dumbed down, but it's pretty easy Latin to read. And that's, that's where I ended up going back after I mistakenly tried to jump into advanced level stuff, namely Cicero. Um, you know, other Latin stuff, good question, you know. Um, I, I guess I would say that Seneca's Latin is kind of intermediate. There's a lot of rhetorical structure there, but, you know, it's it's pretty readable. Um, and, you know, and some of Canterbury, somebody who I read a lot, that would work. Um, I would say at, at the advanced level, Augustine, uh, Cicero, you know, people like that. I mean, there's also Lactantius, who I haven't actually read in the Latin yet, but apparently his Latin is supposed to be really good, and he might be between intermediate and, and advanced. Now, in the Greek, I mean, I'm reading Greek stuff basically uh, either out of curiosity or as a research tool. Aristotle is definitely easier to read than Plato, and his his writing is not Koine, but it's kind of in between Attic Greek and Koine. I can tell you that when I took the Greek sequence, um, they had us starting out for our early, like, take the, the training wheels off, we're going to actually read a book. We read some speeches by Lysias, and then we read Lucian's True History. And Lucian, you know, Lucian can be tricky, but he's, he's, he's not bad. And we read Plato's um, Credo, which is a pretty straightforward work. 
Um, and then you just kind of progress, you know. I, I didn't do these things the way that many other people do, I would say. All right. Um, Massacre, how should I read, use Freud for philosophy? Is he, is he of any value today? Early psychological, late sociocultural Freud, is he more useful for ethics, epistemology, hermeneutics, useful secondary lit? I'm not going to go into useful secondary lit. That's a lot of question already there. Um, you should read Freud as if people at either extreme of talking about Freud are full of shit. So the people who are like, Freud has been totally debunked, man. He's no good. Full of shit, right? People who are like, Freud has got the answers for everything. They're full of shit. I've always been full of shit, right? Um, in the middle, you're going to find people who are like, well, he's got some useful insights. He's got some limitations as well to his approach. Uh, there's a lot of assumptions built in, which maybe we want to question. You can also look at some of the people that are working off of Freud or are connected to him. And I'm going to bring up two in particular. One is Lou Andrea Salome, one of the uh, early students of Freud, who also like was, at, you know, at the time that she begins her correspondence with him, she's also taking stuff with Adler, who by that time is one of the enemies, right? Um, and she's got some interesting, you know, discourse with him. She, um, she's also, you know, she's a woman. Uh, she's not sort of the typical woman, uh, but she she is bringing some perspectives to Freud and Freudianism, seeing some of the blind spots. Another person that's kind of interesting is, is Jacques Lacan. You know, Lacan views his works as a return to the original true insights of Freud that have been already papered over just decades after Freud has given them by the Freudian establishment. And so when you're going through Lacan's works, you're, you're seeing somebody who's like a reformer in a certain way, right? Reformer isn't going back to the original and saying that we need to do that. Um, I teach Freud in like my philosophy of human nature class uh, because he does have, you know, a viewpoint on human nature. And, and I, I have my students uh, read some of the stuff about the, you know, tripartite psychology um, and, and some of the stuff, the later stuff that you're talking about where it's more sociocultural. Uh, you know, you can, just like with anybody else, you want to read it with some attention to when it's coming out and what he's responding to. And you also want to, you know, take what he has to say with the proverbial grain of salt, right? I will say this. Um, I was just working with a client last week and we were looking at parts of James's uh, The Varieties of Religious Experience. There in the chapter on conversion continued, James actually brings up Freud and a whole bunch of other people who he says are working, doing basically the same thing, you know, noticing that we have what Freud calls subconscious or unconscious. Other people are calling other things James calls subliminal consciousness. So, you know, a lot of Freud's ideas are not like radically out of the blue or anything like that. So that's that's worth keeping in mind. All right. Mark is is asking, uh, how's it going? I hope I'm feeling better. I was I was sick uh, for a week and a half, really fatigued, kind of a sinus headache and stuff like that. I am feeling better. I'm not feeling better yet to go to the gym, but uh, I'm feeling a good, be good bit better. I mentioned a few AMAs ago that my favorite movie is The Duelists. I watched it recently. Great film. Interesting exploration of Thumos. Yeah. So that is good insight. Um, if you don't, if you're not familiar with this film that we're referencing, it is a um, early Ridley Scott film just gorgeous. That's one of the reasons why I love it so much, because the way it's filmed, the scenery, the um, whatever you call the backdrops that they're in, uh, staging, I guess, uh, the music score is, it really places you in there, and, and it's just, it's beautiful. And it's two main characters. Um, Harvey Keitel is a kind of a prick, <laughs> officer, very uh, full of himself, uh, causing trouble, getting in trouble in the Napoleonic Wars on the French side. And is it, uh, it's Peter Carradine is, I think, or is it, or is it Keith? Um, one of the, one of the Carradines is the 
the officer who is told to go and arrest Harvey Keitel. And it leads to the first duel between the two of them. And then uh, it's inconclusive and they begin dueling at the time that they meet. And now Harvey Keitel wants to duel and the, the other main character, the Caridian character, is trying to avoid as much as possible, but he's actually the better duelist. And, you know, in a way you could say that we want to think of it in terms of like control over Thumos, this, this active, passionate, uh, aggressive part of ourselves that is involved in attacks, defense, uh, social status. Harvey Keitel is driven by Thumos. And whenever you're driven by just Thumos, you screw up a lot. And the other guy has got Thumos in, in control, but he has to have it because otherwise he's going to get killed by Harvey Keitel's character, right? So, yeah, it, you know, that would be a good film to watch and actually maybe have like a, a discussion group about, you know, I kind of like that idea. All right, let's see. Elijah asks, how do you put Blondell into dialogue with Hegel and McIntyre? So that's a good question. So Blondell here is Maurice Blondell, not Eric Blondell, the uh, Nietzsche uh, author who was big when I was in graduate school. Maurice Blondell is a very important uh, 19th century, 20th century uh, French Catholic philosopher. As a matter of fact, I have the book actually here. Is, I've been reading from it uh, in, in things. Uh, the bulk of my first book of translations is actually bits and pieces of Blondel's stuff. And I wrote my dissertation on Maurice Blondel. Blondel is often called the Catholic Hegel or the French Hegel because they're both taking dialectical, systematic approaches to things. Um, Blondel read Hegel. What we know that he read is primarily the science of logic. Uh, the phenomenology was not big at the time that Blondel was actually studying. That's later in the 20th century when people like Kojav and Hippolyte are kind of, you know, uh, what would you say? They're, they're, they're making the claim that this is really the, the, the real stuff. You know, the logic is important, but not that many people are, are reading it. So, um, yeah, how would I put, I mean, I wouldn't place him in, con, in, in relation to Hegel because other people have already done that work. Um, unfortunately, most of that has been done in German and isn't translated. Uh, Peter Enrique is, is an important person in that. Um, Mundell is definitely responding to Hegel, but he's not like saying that Hegel is the most important person uh, in, in studying philosophy by any means. I'm just going to adjust this lighting a little bit. Um, you know, Hegel fits into modern thought, which is very much focused on the subject. And um, Hegel is kind of an interesting antagonist because he is interested in religion, but religion, as, as even Kierkegaard pointed out, in a very different sense than many religious people um, view it. Now, McIntyre. McIntyre got to know Blondell in part because I brought up uh, Blondell in conversations with McIntyre that I had at Notre Dame after we did the seminar, as well as Gabriel Marcel, um, I, I said to McIntyre, I came in and McIntyre, you know, we were doing sort of a back and forth. He wanted to find out stuff from me specifically about Blondell, in part because I talked about these, you know, um, 1930s Christian philosophy debates, right? At that time, I was working on that book. And um, so he kind of grilled me on, on Blondell, who he didn't really know well at the time. And then I also told him, you know, have you ever read Gabriel Marcel? And he said, yeah, I mean, I've read him a long time ago. And I said, your work has a lot of themes in common when it comes to like the body and how to interpret things with, with Marcel. And he was like, well, I'll have to give, check him out, you know. Um, now, I think you're probably asking because of the concept of tradition. So Blondell does have a, a concept of tradition. Uh, it's not exactly the same thing as McIntyre's concept of tradition. So we got to, you know, be careful to avoid ambiguities. But there is significant overlap and room for productive interaction, I would say. Um, so that, that's, that's, I guess, probably enough on that. Um, Davoud, good to see you, Dav Davoud. I owe you a long email. I'll, I'm actually going to say something personal here. Davoud is a friend of mine. 
and we have been connected, though we've never actually been in the same place at the same time, we've been connected virtually, as is Mark Smith, same, same sort of deal. Maybe someday we'll actually meet up face to face. And Davood wrote me, we, you know, we've done these, these sessions, if you haven't seen them, on Davood's channel, which is, by the way, very good. Um, we do these, these things where we get together and we just kind of chat for about an hour about a given topic. And the next one we're going to do is about humility. Um, we've done uh, ones about like work and, and other things. And, and my, my <laughs> the mood loads of the thing in his channel, I was going to take sort of like a best hits of them and, and I haven't gotten around to it yet. And I, I, you know, Davood wrote me, oh, it's a, it's a while back. And I got caught in a bad dynamic that a lot of you probably wind up in as well. So I didn't respond to the email right away about what we should do this, this month. Right. And then you feel like, oh man, if I write back, I better make it a good email, right? So then you put it off and it gets down further on the to-do list. And then of course, with being you know worn out, I, I didn't get to half of the stuff I was supposed to do. And it, it, you can keep on adding more and more like, oh, now it's really gotta be a good email. And, and the thing to do then, as I did just a few days ago, is to email back and say, oh, really sorry for being out of touch. Um, let's start this conversation going. So that may be a little help for, for some of you who are procrastinators of uh, such. Uh, ben Feltz, to quote the title of Angela Davis's book, I believe prisons are obsolete. Well, that's a complicated question. A lot of prisons are obsolete. Prisons per se are not, because you better figure out what you're going to do with people who are incredibly dangerous offenders. When I taught at Indiana State Prison, you know, we would get into these conversations where a lot of the guys would be like, yeah, you know, I tell the judges, I tell the, the volunteers, I tell the chaplain that I'm innocent, but actually I did this stuff and I did a lot more than they caught me for. Uh, but, you know, I still think sentencing guidelines in Indiana are kind of harsh and, you know, I think that there should be parole. They didn't, they didn't have it at the time in Indiana. Um, but see that guy over there? I hope that guy never gets out of prison because he scares the living shit out of me. What are you going to do with those people? Now, I understand that's that's a smaller number than the general prison population. But these, these you know, abolition things, those of us who've actually worked in prisons and interacted with prisoners, um, I think a lot of us are pretty dubious about that. And so it's kind of a non-starter. Um, I think a good you know, starter is figuring out how can we drastically improve prisons? How can we reorient them? But should we get rid of them altogether? That seems very naive to me. Thomas Lodger, how different is the stranger in French? Well, you got to see what you mean by different. Obviously, it's in a different language, but it's a language that's you know, much closer to English than, say, Czech or Yoruba. You know, so it's it's written in a very simple to read French, and any English translation should probably reflect that. I mean, you'd actually have to ask, you know, how different is it from this translation to this translation to this translation? Not something I've really done. Um, so I, I don't think I have a good answer for that. Uh, Reiko Wallach asks a question that... Um, I, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer this. Do Marx's published works represent a coherent system or do publications after a certain point represent a change in his thought? I, I, don't, I mean, I don't see a difference between those to begin with. Uh, I mean, are you saying that a coherent system would be like every single work has to be like on exactly the same page? Because systems evolve, you know, so... Uh, particularly <laughs> or dialectic and dynamic. Um, I mean, Marx is in his system, if we want to call it that, talking about how change happens and, and changes in consciousness. So like Hegel, it should take account of that. Um, I, I don't know that if it's, if it's one big coherent system. It's certainly an incomplete system because uh, a good portion of it is trying to make sense out of how capitalism works, and obviously capitalism did not stop evolving 
with the death of Marx, I mean, a lot of transitions in the 20th century and the 21st century that might not fit in all that well. I mean, Marx is pretty comprehensive in addressing the the matters of his his time. So, but I don't really have much more to say about that. Jeff says, I um, uh, hope I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, what do you think of Henri Bergson? Any favorite works of his? Just finish Time and Free Will and definitely want to read more. Yeah, that is the place to start, Time and Free Will. It's actually a mistranslation of the title, which is, should be translated as the essay on the immediate givens of consciousness or the immediate data of consciousness, the essay sur le uh, donné de la conscience, right? And that's a good place to start because you, you get a lot of the key ideas of Bergson woven in there, the difference between quantity and quality, spatiality, temporality. I mean, I think that um, Bergson and Maurice Blondel are basically doing good phenomenology outside of the phenomenological movement. And a good friend of mine who is at Boston College, he's, he's a... He might be dean of the library now. I mean, he's he's kind of a, a go-getter guy. Um, wrote a Christian Dupont uh, wrote a dissertation at Notre Dame that very conclusively argues that the the opening to German phenomenology in France that we see happening from like the twenties through the the fifties, the way to that was paved by Bergson and by Blondel. I would say we should add Gabriel Marcel to that as well. Um, but yeah, Bergson is, is important. Um, he, uh, you know, he's got an interesting book on laughter, which clearly doesn't get to the sole root of comedy because there isn't one, but it is, it is a good contribution. Um, he's got this interesting work that he brings out during the Christian philosophy debates, but it's not really related to it, the two sources of morality and religion. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of untapped potential, you could say, in Bergson's work. Um, he was important for revitalizing metaphysics in, in 20th century France. So well worth reading. Um, Benjamin, thanks for making great videos. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, do you have thoughts, opinions on ordinary language philosophy and your Neoplatonism? Yeah, they're not related at all. Um, they're they're not connected to each other. Ordinary language philosophy is a 20th century analytic uh, sub movement, and Neoplatonism um, and Neoplatonism is something that goes back, you know, several millennia and takes on a number of different forms. Um, some of which get largely incorporated into Christian and, and Islamic uh, thought, uh, to some degree of Jewish thought with, you know, a feel of Al Alexandria as well. So I don't see any connection between the two of them. Um, yeah. Uh, Efron, would you say Hegel is the greatest philosopher to ever live? Are there any flaws in his work? Many, many flaws in his work. Uh, history didn't end when he said it ended, right? Uh, there's, there's, uh, there is no greatest philosopher ever as far as I'm concerned. So that's kind of a non-starter for me. Um, just like there's no greatest uh, metal band even for me. You know, I mean, wearing a Motorhead T-shirt, right? Because I love Motorhead. If you would have asked 16-year-old Greg who's the best metal band of all, it would have been Iron Maiden. Now, if you ask me, you know, there's like a constellation of stars that are all connected together. It's the same way with philosophy, you know? Why would Hegel be the greatest philosopher ever? I think anybody who spends a lot of time with Hegel and isn't a sort of cultish Hegelian, um, is going to see lots of flaws and is, you know, it'll take the shine off of him just as much as if you spend a lot of time with Descartes or Plato. Um, these aren't perfect sages, the, these philosophers. Michael says, this is a, a more of a local question. I'm hearing Aaron Rodgers may wind up in Tennessee. What do you think? Go Pat, go. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think th so. Aaron Rodgers, for those who don't know American football, right? He is one of the greatest quarterbacks um, in terms of talent, in terms of common sense, and you know, being a role model. 
kind of a schlub these days. You know, he, he got himself into a lot of hot water over his fake vaccination status and then lying about it and then blaming people for it and all that. But let's put that aside. He's, he's you know, a top tier quarterback. And um, unlike Tom Brady, he, he was never really surrounded by a machine to, you know, get, provide him with victories. Um, what is Rodgers going to do? Well, one of one of three things. So one is he could just retire, in which case the Packers are kind of screwed, right? <laughs> because now, now we're placed into the position of trying to find another really good quarterback because we've been so spoiled all, really since the 90s, right? We had Brett Favre, who was great, but super flawed. I mean, he threw lots and lots of interceptions. And then we got Aaron Rodgers, who was on the bench while Brett Favre was, was there. And Rodgers turned out to be just amazing, like, you know, like Favre, except without the interceptions and, and a much better leader than Favre. Favre is a, a, a thoroughly stupid guy and um, has gotten himself involved in scandals, not just about dick pics, but about like, you know, robbing the welfare system down in his home state. Just a, you know, kind of a, a real real schmuck, uh, but a good player, right? So we've gotten used to having really, really good quarterbacks. And then, you know, sometimes good defensive players, good, um, you know, supporting offensive players. What's going to happen if, if Rogers retires? Well, now we got to find somebody else to fill that, that spot. And we could turn out to be like some of the other teams that just never found anybody like the bears our our big rival. Um, they keep on looking for the next great quarterback and it just doesn't happen for those poor bastards. Right. Um, or he could go down somewhere else. Uh, Tennessee, the Titans, that would be a big surprise. Um, I, I don't know why he would want to be, um, there. I mean, he's, he's a, he's a West coast guy by, by birth and training. Um, He's lived in Green Bay, which has this really like great fan base and stuff like that. Why go to a spot like Tennessee? You know, I mean, there's there's nothing there really um, that would that would be attractive, other than the chance to like you know build his own team. And I guess you know the Titans did pretty good, but I don't know. I, there was other teams that people were talking about him going to, um, or he could stay in Green Bay. And if he stays in Green Bay. That just kicks the can down the road. If you know this expression, kick the can down the road, it means you, you, you don't solve a problem right now, you solve it later, and maybe he gets to go to the Super Bowl, you know, this coming year, you know, uh, although we've had so many shots to get there and, and we, we just keep screwing it up. Um, maybe he's tired of that, you know. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with the management of, of the Packers and who they want to bring in. But no matter what, sooner or later, we got to get a new quarterback, right? So, all right. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, I'll see if you've got any questions down there somewhere. And uh, Rough Bumble. Oh, yeah, so this is interesting. Thank you for your good review of how animals grieve. So I'll, I'll say two things about that. Um, one is Barbara King herself actually thanked me on Twitter, which is really nice, you know, when the, the person, and she's not a follower, right. Uh, when, or she is now, I think, but you know, when somebody out of the blue says, Hey, I liked your, your review of my book. Um, and there's somebody, you know, who's got some considerable stature in the field. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool. The other thing is I am working and this is not something that's going to come out like this year or next year or anything like that. I'm working on a book, and this is why I read Barbara King, um, on how to make end-of-life decisions for pets, for the owners, right? Because it's very difficult. I saw my wife having to go through making decisions that were very tough for our, uh, the, you know, the one cat that we have who, who died years ago, and then we've had two dogs as well, and they're both gone. So... I wanted to, you know, when I saw the title, I was like, that's probably some good research for me. And it turned out it is, it is quite good research. It's a great book. I'd, I'd recommend it. All right. Um, Cinder, do you think the theory of Rizantamon is used as a way of naturalizing power? Perhaps I misread Shaler, but near the end, he seems to do that. Well, I don't think there's a theory of Rizantamon. I think that, that Mark Shaler uh, reinterprets Nietzsche's conception of Rizantamon. 
Can it be used as a way of naturalizing power? I don't think it's a way of naturalizing power. I think it's certainly a way of trying to get people trusted in your points of view, right? It, it has some relations to power, but I don't see, I don't quite see naturalizing power as part of that. So, um, and I will say this, that Rizanthamont is definitely a complex phenomena that, um, you know, it's different in Nietzsche, it's different in Shaler, it's different in other people who, who make use of it. So it's, it's kind of hard to talk about a theory of it. Um, Nona Gan, what resources would you recommend for someone wanting to get a comprehensive view of the history of philosophy? History of philosophy, <laughs> right? Read around. Um, I don't. I don't have resources that I would suggest for that. Uh, there's. There's absolutely no substitute for actually doing the reading. And I would lower the bar. Don't try to have a comprehensive view of the history of philosophy because guess what? Nobody does. Um, nobody that I've ever seen does. Even the people who are pretty good, like Cobbleston, there's people who are left out. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry about a comprehensive view. Um, Alejandro, which do you think is better for intermediate readers, confessions, or city of God? Why not both? Uh, intermediate readers in what sense, too? Are we talking about intermediate Latin readers? Augustine is going to be tough for you then. Um, intermediate readers of philosophical works? You know, they're both, they're both things that you should encounter and read. Um, one thing that you will have to get used to is there's a lot of scripture references and you might want to skip over some of them because Augustine will sometimes just lard them in until you figure out what he's doing with them, right? Um, May to Clay, how do you deal with insecurity about posting philosophy blogs, blog articles, I'm guessing, if you're new to it? I want to post things I've written but feel <clears throat> insecure. I haven't done enough research or that it's not good enough. Well, you can preface your blog article by saying, maybe I'm not the last authority on this, and I'm sure there's better people who to talk about this, but here's my here's here's my my view. And that sort of gets your audience ready. Um, you know, you could also consider where you're gonna post it. There's there's some places that are probably a lot less hostile and a lot more receptive than others. You can write your blog and you don't have to make it public right away. Um, there's lots of lots of ways that you can kind of cushion the blows of rejection that <laughs> I think you're probably fearing, right? Um, and, you know, I will say this too. The only way that you get good at writing stylistically in terms of a researcher reflection is by doing lots and lots and lots of it. So, if you want to start a philosophy blog, maybe you keep it private at first <clears throat> and only share it with a few friends, but you do a lot of writing. And over time, your writing is going to improve. And you can also go back to earlier stuff that you wrote. I do this myself and say, how, how can I update this? How can I make this better? Like I'm taking stuff from my blog, Arexis Dianoetike, which I started way back when I was teaching at Fayetteville State University, I want to say like in 2009 or 2010, and I've been slowly closing that blog down, taking articles that are still worth reading and putting them into my medium uh, space. So, you know, maybe, maybe that would be something. All right. Uh, let's see here. NL, have you read any Graham Harmon? Little bits. I've also met the guy and interacted with him. Not super impressed. Um, I, I kind of think the the speculative realism thing. I you know when people were talking about, it, like, have you learned about speculative realism? I was like, this doesn't really seem that new to me. Uh, maybe I'm not getting it. You know. Um, so yeah, I've been kind of underwhelmed. You could say. Um, Russell uh, says, what do you think of the work of Nick Land? Not much. It's not crap. It's not great. Um, it's kind of standard fair continental philosophy from the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. It's, you know, there's a lot of assertion, very little, you know, 
making backing up the claims that he's making. Uh, I kind of think he's become one of those figures that a lot of people like with Hegel too, right? A lot of people are like super into Hegel, but they don't actually understand what Hegel's saying. So it's got this kind of noumena or aura of being really cool stuff. If you actually understand what he's saying, which I do because I've I've read the people that he's he's talking about and referencing, you're like, yeah, okay, that's that's a nice conference paper. Um, I mean, I would disagree with it here, here, here. I think that this is just wild speculation. Um, and, you know, this is very jargony. Uh, there's a lot of substitution of jargon for, for like genuine engagement with things. But that's like, you know, thousands of other continental academics of that time. So, yeah. Um, Ron James, have you ever read the, the Count of Monte Cristo? I haven't read it. It's one of those things that I probably should have read when I was a kid, but uh, didn't. Um, NL, are you a fan of early death metal, black metal, extreme stuff? Nope, not interested in that stuff at all. Um, other people, I'm not knocking it. Other people might be interested in it and think it's cool. I'm interested in classic heavy metal, which does include, say, you know, Venom, right? Um, but what black metal turned into is, is, is a good bit different than what Venom was doing in the early 80s. By the way, when Venom were describing themselves, or at least cross interview, he was like, we're black metal, power metal, speed metal. He, he wasn't saying we're exclusively black metal, a, a new genre, which we are the you know originators of or anything like that. That revision stuff from later on. Um, I, I just, you know, I knew kids who were into death metal when I was in high school and I was like, I'm not going down that that route. I'm interested in, in in that. You know, it doesn't doesn't grip me. Um, so you know, I'm much more interested in proto metal in the in the late '60s, um, actual classic heavy metal in the '70s and '80s, and then what those bands were doing later on in the '90s through today, and in genres of metal that kind of spawn from that like you know thrash I, i'm interested in that in power metal in uh the new wave of traditional heavy metal of course you know um and that's you know that's that's where i uh spend my time you only get 24 hours a day and you can't do everything so you know my my tastes were formed kind of early um in the in the period when a lot of this stuff was coming out but I picked up a book on whim Emil Myerson's identity and reality or if you, are you familiar with it not only am I not familiar I've never heard of it so uh NL313 debt what is the bottom or ground express in Nietzsche's rope walker analogy from thus spoke Zarathustra um you know a hard surface that you die on I don't, I don't know that everything in a metaphor has to have a correlate in something. Um, I mean, it, it, it'll kill you, right? It'll break you. Russell, do you think there's an inherent philosophy to Bitcoin? I mean, if there is, it's probably a selfish, uh, full of yourself asshole, right? Because <laughs> most of the people that I, I encounter who are all about Bitcoin fit that description. Uh, no, I don't think there's any sort of inherent philosophy to, to Bitcoin. I think that people, you know, bring in stuff to try to explain what they're doing. And it's usually some really half-baked uh, uh, philosophy stuff. I, I mean, it, it's attractive to libertarians, but libertarians are, as a movement, complete mess, right? So, so yeah, I, I don't I don't know that there's there's any sort of thing to that. I mean, we could also ask, is there an inherent philosophy to NFTs? No, I don't I don't think so. Um, Rezo audio seems to be stuttering a little. I don't have any control over that. So you know those those sort of comments totally unhelpful, right? There's nothing I can do about it. Uh, Velvet Rose, I've been reading Aristotle's Politics, watching your videos about it. Which translation is the best one from your perspective? I have a video, Dr. Sadler responds, which translation is the best? The short answer is, I don't know, <laughs> but you can watch the video and find out. I am not a uh, compare translations and recommend them because I can read it in the Greek. So I don't know. Um, Ollie Power, what do you make of Giannis uh, Varafu, uh, Varoufakis's position that capitalism is replaced by techno-feudalism? 
Um, I haven't actually read him, so I can't weigh in on that. Any sort of everything has changed sort of narratives. I, I'm pretty skeptical of myself. Um, so I, I, you know, techno feudalism sounds really cool, but I, I don't know exactly what it amounts to in uh, his theory. So I'm, I'm leery about uh, saying anything about that. Um, Cinder, have you read Domenico Lasordos's book on Nietzsche? Nope. I mean, most people asking me questions about fairly obscure authors, the answer is going to be no. Nope. You know, again, 24 hours every day. Um, there's not a lot of time to read everybody. I spend most of my time reading and rereading primary texts. Um, I'm not. I'm not usually very big on reading secondary lit on on people these days. <laughs> And I, you know, I, I may be like leaving myself out of the conversation. I'm cool with that. If I can understand Nietzsche on Nietzsche's grounds, that's great. You know, uh, rant man, sovereign citizen. Oh, one of those. Do you think the tragedy of the commons relates to economics and that we're nearing a fiat collapse? <laughs> I don't think we're nearing a fiat collapse, whatever that happens to be. Um, you know, and the tragedy of the commons, does it relate to economics? Yeah, we talk about it in business ethics all the time. Um, but what is the connection between these things? I don't see a connection. All right, Gerard, I'm new to philosophy. I've been reading some encyclopedic stuff <clears throat> before getting into works proper. Utilitarianism is the only ethical theory that makes any sense to me, but it seems to be looked down upon by a vast amount of people who tend to discuss the topic on forums and whatnot. Why is this so? So, I mean, don't give a shit what people on forums say <laughs> to begin with, because um, a lot of them, from my experience of looking at forums, a lot of people don't know what the hell they're talking about. So why pay any attention to them? I mean, go, you wanna see some crazy stuff, go look at the uh, Stoicism Facebook forums. They're 90%, you know, either garbage or grifters and then, you know, 10% decent stuff, but the 10% decent stuff gets those same people weighing in. So you don't want to take what people on forums as, as particularly determinative. Um, utilitarianism, uh, perfectly respectable philosophy. As a matter of fact, it gets used a lot in, for example, business ethics, right? Um the, uh, you know, there's a utilitarian tradition that you can read, uh, which officially begins with Bentham and it includes Mill and Sidgwick and goes all the way to Peter Singer in the present. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I mean, if, if I were saying something like, this is the only ethical theory that makes sense to me, I would look at that statement and say, wow, given the fact that a lot of smart people have other ethical theories that make sense to them, maybe there's something wrong with my current perspective in that I'm thinking that this is the only one that makes sense. I mean, utilitarianism, a lot of it makes sense to me. So does a lot of virtue ethics. So does a lot of deontology. So does a lot of ethics of care because they all have something worthwhile to them. Hell, even, and, uh, even Ayn Rand got some things right. Usually things that other people got right as well. But so um, don't just read encyclopedic stuff because you don't know whether it's right or not. I mean, when you read a history of philosophy or an encyclopedia entry, how do you know that they got Kant right? Maybe they didn't, right? It's, it's sort of like the translation problem. You don't know whether a translation is a good translation until you go to the original and read that, unless you can find somebody else who you have confidence in who can say, well, this is no, this is a really good one. How do you know that uh, the encyclopedic stuff that you're reading doesn't leave out key figures? Like say Mary Wollstonecraft, you know, read a lot of history of philosophies, very important uh, 19th century or 18th century virtue ethicist and and uh, first wave feminist, not even addressed in a lot of them. Good example of a contemporary uh, history of philosophy that is shitty in this way, Grayling's history of philosophy. Very, very few women authors, even though they deserve a place in that history. And why? Because uh, I guess Grayling must be kind of uh, just following, um, you know, a, a uh, misogynistic tradition or something. Jonathan, can you help me understand <clears throat> the hopeful turn, turn tone at the end of Genealogy's second treatise, second essay, you mean, turning bad conscience in on itself? How is this possible? 
Um, I mean, Nietzsche thinks that bad conscience was able to make it interesting, you know, sort of like uh, the priest figure he talks about in the first essay. And some of that is spelled out in the third essay, right? We realize that we are halfway healthy, halfway sick, and we use the resources that bad conscience developed for us, like the introspection and asceticism and all that. We use it against itself. Is there like a blueprint for that? No, there, there isn't, uh, fortunately. Um, you know, you, you, can, you can think about what would Nietzsche do in those, those cases. Um, all right, let's see here. Abhi Manu, you know, not even a question here, just repeating something that Whitehead said, and probably one of the dumber things that Whitehead has said. <laughs> Western philosophy is just footnotes to Plato. I mean, that's ridiculous. Anybody who's spent much time studying Western philosophy knows that's that's a, a nice line, but definitely not true. Um, only one. Just wanted to thank you for your help with the myth of Sisyphus and Hegel and Zarathustra. Much appreciated. Oh, you're very, very welcome. Glad that it was helpful to you. Um, uh, Saladin, uh, question I get kind of often. Love your work. Wanted to ask you, you work a lot on Christian philosophy. Have you ever wanted to go into Jewish or Islamic philosophy? Um, I've, you know, I've read some, but it's always in translation and I don't read Arabic. So there's no point in me trying to put myself out there as a, an expert. And there's many other people that you could be, why go to me on something I'm not particularly good at when there's plenty of other people you can go to? We share the labor. So no, I'm not, I'm not interested in doing work on Islamic philosophy. I don't read Hebrew, so there's not a hell of a lot of point in me trying to, um, you know, go into much Jewish philosophy. I mean, I read Philo of Alexandria because he writes in Greek. Right? So, uh, you know, and of course there's the Septuagint and stuff like that, but no, I, I mean, and I don't do, you know, I, so I've got a book here, right? This is an important thing, but would you, would you really say that the majority of the work that I do is on Christian philosophy? I'd say maybe half, depending on how we define Christian, is Descartes a Christian philosopher? Then he, he falls into that, that bunch. Is Hegel a Christian philosopher? Yeah, okay, maybe. Uh, like Stanley Rosen said, if he is, he's in a church of one, you know, because nobody else uh, really holds the, the views on Christianity that, that Hegel himself develops. Um, I mean, I do a lot of work on pre-Christian um, Greek and Roman philosophy and a lot of work on um, modern philosophy and, and late modern philosophy. So um, there are some important Christian philosophers I, I do work a lot on like Anselm of Canterbury, but yeah. Um, um, another one, basically the same answer, Efron. Have you read any Islamic philosophers? Uh, are you planning to read any of these personalities? What do you think of Islamic philosophy? Something for other people to do, right? It's not my, not my area, not something for me to really say anything about. Um, I'd be more inclined if I was going to um, do work on another area to look into, you know, the vast history of Chinese philosophy. But all right, um, Raid, um, do you think there's anything to Nietzsche's views on order of rank among men, or is it silly elitism? Yeah, there's there's things to think about Nietzsche's views on order of rank among human beings, not just men. Um, it's not just silly elitism. Um, you know, there's lots and lots of philosophers who have views on uh, order of rank among human beings. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, are you against elitism just in general? You've got to define what you mean by elitism then. All right. Um, let's see here. RT, Brian Johnson says Epictetus looks to natural acquired relations to locate social roles. Is this a proper application? If I take on a husband-wife relation, then I have a role as a husband. Yeah, and Epictetus is super clear about this. Johnson just happened to write a whole book about it, the role of Epictetus. 
um, which is, I think is a good book. Um, it's got some, some flaws and parts from my point of view, but you know, he wrote a book and I didn't. So he's, he's a good step ahead of me on that matter. Uh, Epictetus very much is about fulfilling our, our roles, you know, our obligations. One of the good points I think actually about Brian Johnson's book is that he doesn't just talk about Epictetus. He also talks about the concept of roles in Cicero's On Duties, which is another another great work. Um, Russell Henry Bieber, what do you think of Curtis Yarvin, The Dark Enlightenment Thinkers? I first started reading them when I was still living in Indiana and teaching in the prison. So we're talking about um, early to mid 2000s. I thought they were they were interesting, but very derivative. Um, I, a lot of, and this is in part because I was working on um, 20th century uh, French philosophy, uh, like, you know, Maurice Blondel, and I was, you know, encountering proto fascist organizations like Action Francaise and, and Charles, Charles Morat, and reading all this, this sort of, you know, traditionalist stuff, um, traditionalist in the real sense, not, not the people who call themselves traditionalists today who are not actually traditional about their traditionalism. Um, people like, you know, Demise and De Bonald and, and Laminay and people like that. Um, I found what he had to say interesting in parts, but like from a sort of flawed vision overall and often, often, you know, as time went on more and more and more superficial as he became a media figure, I think, um, he kind of declined to go back to the Nick land stuff, the stuff that land has been doing since he got into dark enlightenment from what I've read of it. And I can't say that I've read all of it. It's, it's kind of flattened out, you know, it's, it's not very insightful or interesting, I think. So a lot of people have really got into it, you know, um, and understandable because it's you know it's exciting and all of that. All right, uh, Ashwin, I had asked this question last time, but Earthsea Book Four ending, so we're talking about Tahanu, still bothers me. Her use of violence to resolve a conflict is so unlikely. It's not true at all. <laughs> is there a deeper meaning or something more ending? Violence or justice? Is it just like sheer violence? A dragon shows up and brrr, attacks everybody? No. I mean, the creator of everything, uh, the oldest dragon in existence, shows up to save his daughter and somebody else who, by the way, in the last book, he had brought all the way to, to Roke and then to Gaunt, namely the Archmage Ged. So, I mean, the way that you're construing it places an emphasis on one little feature rather than on, on the context. And I, I would say that's probably where your issue is arising, you know? Um, I mean, if you think that violence wasn't involved in some sense in the previous three novels, I, I, I don't think you've read them adequately. You know, um, there's dying in the tombs of Atuan, right? And, and one of the key resolutions is uh, Arha slash Tenar almost kills Ged, right? She gets a knife out and she's going to stab him. And then she gets control over herself. Wizard of Earthsea, um, he assimilates the shadow, but he's fighting the shadow. And in um, the, the farthest shore, they kill Cobb, <laughs> Right? So who's been killing all these other people and dragons? So I, I, I don't I don't really see a, a problem like that. Um, and yeah, there is a deeper meaning or something more to the ending. I mean, uh, Theru, the burnt child, is recognized by somebody who, who later on we find out is not just um, Kalesi and the oldest dragon in existence, but Segoy, the very creator of Earthsea, as his daughter. That's pretty damn significant, you know. We have an overcoming of a uh, evil force happening. So, all right. Uh, Greco says, "Have you ever worked on politics?" Uh, yeah, <laughs> I have articles out there on politics. Uh, Thomas, have you ever done psychedelics like mushroom? Uh, did they have an effect on you? I mean, your worldview or philosophy? No, I, I, no. The strongest thing I've I've ever done, you know, is ecstasy. And I can't tell, I mean, this was back in the 90s when I was with a, a 
a druggy German girlfriend and I was, I was high and drunk at the time. So I don't know what sort of effect it really had on me. Oh, I will say this. I did have a, a cousin who, um, again, back in the nineties who, uh, uh, sprinkled CCP into the joints that he was passing around. And I did not like that experience at all. Um, that was, that was pretty, pretty rough. I'm not into psychedelics. Um, I myself consider them, you know, here's my take. They don't open the doors to consciousness unless there's already something lacking, very lacking in your life. If you need psychedelic and you can't do ascetic exercises or, you know, meditation to get to the same place, then you want to ask why, why you need the psychedelics, you know? Um, so I'm not, you know, I'm not a big fan. Um, Adel Huxley, by the way, drew a lot of criticism from spiritual leaders who are like, you're trying to shortcut the process. And like all other shortcuts, you're missing stuff along the way. So I'm not, I'm not big on that. Craig, um, curious if you're aware of any resources that evaluate or analyze human behavior, current or past behavior, similar, similarly as <clears throat> how economists try to model actions in a financial market, or scientists, um, I mean, economics is trying to model human behavior, right? Um, yeah, there's all sorts of models out there. I don't, I'm not particularly well versed on them because I don't do quantitative analysis or statistical modeling or stuff like that. Um, and I think anybody who wants to put much faith in those probably needs to read McIntyre's After Virtue, the chapter on the social sciences. Because as soon as people figure out that you're trying to like metricize uh, them, they they start becoming very unpredictable. And so um, you can model whatever you want. I mean, a lot of stuff is more science fiction than actual science. Um, I would I would say, you know. All right. Uh, SSRV. What has been the musical experience that has most impacted your experience as a philosopher or researcher or reader? Well, that's a good one. That, that is tough to think about. Um, musical experience that has affected how I read, how I philosophize, how I research. Um, I don't know that there is a lot of interconnection between the two of those. Um, I mean, I can say recently we went to Handel's Messiah, you know, and we, and we did so at the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra, which is just like four blocks that way. And, uh, I'd never actually gone to a, a performance of that before. It was really interesting for me because as somebody who has worked on, you know, um, Christian thought and throughout the years, you know, you see just how much Handel was weaving in from um, some of Paul's letters, uh, some of the Old Testament, uh, particularly the Psalms, you know, um, and, uh, you know, seeing the people come forward to sing the solos and, and, you know, looking at it as a work was really something different than the typical alleluia, you know, that we always hear, right? There's so much more to that work. And I, I was kind of reminded of like great works by other people from, you know, early, the early modern, mid-modern period, right? Like Milton's Paradise Lost or things like that. So, uh, but I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't have a thing that's really impacted my experience as a philosopher or reader. Um, RP, have you read Psycho Cybernetic? I don't think so. Uh, emergence as a means of perfect as a participation. I noticed in your bookshelf tour you had a copy of Philip K. Dick's Exegesis. If you have any thoughts about that work or Dick's speculative thought in his later years generally, I think that uh, you know the Exegesis is really useful when I go to do like talks on Dick for seeing what he has to say about his own writing about this stuff. Um, you get you get to peer into the mind of the author himself. Um, I, I don't think that it really is an exegesis in the complete sense of having a text which then is you know explored. 
And it's not just about this, you know, mystical experience or anything that was so profound for him. It's about all sorts of other stuff. I mean, he weaves in like, you know, discussions about robots and whether they can can have empathy or things like that. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a cool work, I would I would say, you know. All right, uh, DCT Revit. What do you think of Mark Cuban saying that the future of higher education as it relates to the workplace will be liberal arts or philosophy? Well, I think that's very nice of him to say that. That's um, good work if you can get it. Is he putting up a, 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 you know, a ton of money that he's got to make this happen? That's what I'd be more curious about because there's lots of people, not just Mark you know, Cuban, who have said liberal arts matters or, or you know, philosophy matters. For every um, moron like uh, Rubio saying, you know, um, we don't need people studying philosophy, we need people studying welding, as if there's like an infinite amount of welding jobs available. There's you know, somebody else saying, no, no, the liberal arts do matter, right? Um, and that's nice. What's, good, what's the actual, like, proposal to make this happen in a time when, you know, liberal arts are really being cut. Great example, and I'm gonna point in another direction, you know, 12 blocks away, Marquette University, Catholic Jesuit University, going the same way as a lot of uh, Catholic higher ed. They've shrunk the core several times. Now you only have to take one philosophy class your entire time at Marquette, and one theology class, and one writing class, right? They're, they're called um, foundations of, and you can't do much in a semester, right? I've taught those classes, not the, the philosophy ones, not theology or, or um, rhetoric. Um, if places like that are allowing the professional schools, in Marquette's case, business, dentistry, law, medicine, you know, uh, phys physiology and stuff like that to crowd out the liberal arts, what do you think is happening in other places? Where, where there isn't a tradition of giving a shit about the liberal arts. I mean, it's great if Kuban wants to talk about that. What's his, uh, what's his intervention? That's what I would, I would want to know. That would be kind of cool to see. Right? Then, then he can become a hero to, to people like us. Uh, Francis, do you think there are objective standards for quality and works of art or regular fiction, writing and such? Yeah, but they're at a lower level. I mean, can you spell the words right? That's an objective standard. Um, no, you know, maybe in some cases you don't need to. There's always like, there's an exception to the rule. But in, in general, you got to, you know, spell your words right and use punctuation. But that's at a low level, right? Are there objective standards the higher up we go? And what you mean by objective? Do you mean like, is there a checklist? Is there something everyone will agree upon? Um, probably not. <clears throat> you know, I don't know that we need them, though. Ooh, here's a good personal question. Stephen Warren, have you ever experienced unrequited love? And is there any advice, philosophical or otherwise, that you found helpful in this regard? If you're asking whether I've felt unrequited love as the lover, then the answer is yes. Um, that has happened in the past. <clears throat> Are you asking whether I've ever had people love me who I don't love back, I don't feel the same way about them? The answer is also yes. Um, and, you know, do I have any advice about that? Advice about, I mean, I, I think lurking in the background is the idea that if you have unrequited love, that's a bad thing. And somebody like Kierkegaard would say, oh, no, that's actually, it's a great thing. You can become a knight of infinite resignation. You know, you can love your lover and you don't have to always get something in return. As a matter of fact, if you really do love them, then maybe it shouldn't bother you that you're not getting something in return. Right. That's that's one way of looking at it. Um, or you could also say to yourself, well, hell, there's like seven billion people on Earth. If I'm not getting the love I want, you know, this sort of temporary feeling that I've got right now towards this person and they're not responding in the way that I want. Maybe I can find somebody else. Odds are you probably can. And I mean, you could also think about, I mean, it could be a useful uh, exercise to say, well, why don't they deserve me back? Why don't they love me back? And maybe the answer is stuff that you're not all that happy about looking at, you know, in yourself, but you could change, you know? Um, I mean, 
let's be really silly about this. You know, what if you only take showers once a week and, you know, you're a really cool person, but your personal hygiene leaves something, you don't brush your teeth, you know, you don't comb your hair. And then, you know, you find somebody and you love them and they're like, yeah, I'm not really that into you, you know, and you notice they like hold their face away a little bit. Well, that's an easy one to fix, right? Start taking showers, start brushing your teeth. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of other things that are harder to fix than that, right? Uh, let's see here. Russell Henry Barber, have you ever listened to Captain Beefheart? Yeah, but I, it's been a long time since I have. Um, oh, Zach, do you have any tips for engaging in political philo philosophical discussion with friends? Make sure they are the kind of friends that want to discuss political and ph philosophical things with you. Some friends just want to like watch the game and eat popcorn and say, oh, yay, and stuff like that. And that's okay. You know, you don't have to try to talk philosophy with them. Others want to go on hikes with you. Others, you know, want to bitch about um, politics, but don't want to go into any depth about it because, you know, they're, they're happier just griping and, and getting to be worked up and they don't want to have any like, you know, reflective self insight. You, you have to have the right kind of friends. And then, you know, the other thing is you're probably going to have disagreements at certain points. And it is important to remind yourself, is it being right that matters to you or is it maintaining the relationship? Not, not to say that you should like buy and drink somebody else's Kool-Aid, right? Um, but at a certain point, you do want to say, we're going to, I'm not even going to say we're going to agree, agree, or disagree, because that's presuming that I speak for you. Uh, let's just leave this where it is and we'll, we'll talk about something else. And if you've got a wide range of friendship, you can do that, right? That's the nice thing. You can find other things to do together where you don't have to be talking um, at odds with each other, right? Uh, Nathan, are the, oh, good question. Other than Bergson and Whitehead, are there any other good process philosophers to look into? There are, in fact, um, Hartshorn. Hartshorn was a major, major process philosopher here in the United States. He wrote quite a bit about it, Charles Hartshorn. So he, he would be somebody I would, I would check into, um, all right. Um, Michael Jimenez, getting ready to do a full reading of Aristotle's metaphysics with some friends aside from the physics. Is there any other Aristotle text we should read as prep? Should we bother with the logic? So there is no the logic. There is a bunch of logical works. There is no single book, the logic. Um, yeah, you probably want to read through the categories, I would say. Um, that couldn't hurt. Interestingly, you're going to see uh, things in the metaphysics that reference politics, for example. He's talking about uh, causes and principles, and he brings up, you know, uh, decisions made by pro races made by people as being causes, you know. But it doesn't mean you have to read the politics. Um, you know, reading the physics before the metaphysics can't hurt. Um, probably want to read on the soul, you know. That might be helpful as well. Um, there's some good discussions in there about like taking multiple perspectives on things. So, yeah. Um, Wim asks, what are your thoughts on nominalism? Do you think the abstract exists due to Kantian idealism or that the abstract is present in the concrete? I mean, they, these are some very abstract terms altogether. Um, I think that there are some things that nominalism is is right about, you know, um, they were very keen to like look at terms and say, quite often we don't have any sense of what the hell we're talking about. You know, <laughs> let's dig into these things that the scholastics, uh, you know, are, are you know, uh, rivals at the time. Uh, yes, nominalism arises within scholasticism, but it also continues outside of that. Um, you know, there, there were some points on which they're, they're probably right. Um, I'm not sure why you would have to buy into some sort of Kantian idealism to get away from nominalism. There's all sorts of ways to get away from nominalism. What's the original um, sort of framing for 
being a non-nominalist, being a Platonist. <laughs> um, and there's all different ways to understand the, the abstract or the ideal or the universal, right? William, what do you think of Orthodox Christianity? I don't have a think of Orthodox Christianity. That that's too that's too wide, too vague to actually answer. Um, Gareth uh, asked if you'd ever written about emergence or top-down causation or talked about it in your videos. Yeah, lots of videos, but they're not videos where I'm saying, today I'm going to talk about emergence, or today I'm going to talk about top-down causation. It's, you know, explicating the text people themselves who have, who have talked about that. So, you know, great example of this is the argument from intelligence in Cicero's On the Nature of the Gods, uh, an argument that kind of fell out of favor, saying you can't get intelligent things from just you know random processes, there has to be some top-down causation that has intelligence being the cause of intelligence. So yeah, I've, I've talked about these sort of things a lot, but never just me sitting down and talking about them. It's always me talking about Augustine talking about it, or you know Cicero talking about it, or somebody else. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, here's a really interesting political question. Ridicule. If you had to guess, what do you think Aristotle's assessment of the American Constitution would be like if he were alive today? <clears throat> so first we got to clarify something. When Aristotle talks about a constitution, he does not mean a written document. He means you could have something like that. He means the entire set of like top, you know, level norms. So he would probably include the things that constitute the organic law, which would also be like the Declaration of Independence. But, he, you know, if you look at, you read the book, The Constitution of Athens, it is a political history from the beginning all the way up to the present. That for Aristotle is the Constitution, the underlying structure. So you could say that what the Tocqueville is doing in uh, Democracy in America is talking about the American Constitution in a Aristotelian way. What would he think of our current state of affairs and previous states of affairs? He'd, he'd probably agree with the Tocqueville in the assessment that America has always been, uh, America as, as a, a political entity has always been a uh, deeply racist country and did incredible injustice. The Tocqueville talks about this to the black and red races. Um, we could expand this further. Um, and that that is a, a significant problem. When you do things like that and you don't fix it, like through an actual reconstruction, you're really laying yourself in for a lot of trouble because you're going to perpetuate injustice and you're not going to have a, a good society. Um, Aristotle would say that Americans are, you know, far too consumeristic. Um, they leave, you know, serving in the military to poor and to the thematic um, and spend way too much money on, on military stuff, sort of like his criticisms of Sparta, you know, in the politics, um, getting very little yield in response, and that our policy making is very schizophrenic. You know, I, I think he would consider us a, a, essentially a, a screwed up um, state. So, and he would say that we're basically an oligarchy, you know. Um, Let's see what else we got. Ricky, have you ever lectured on Marcus Aurelius? Yeah, I mean, you could Google, Sad, you know, Gregory Sadler, Marcus Aurelius, and I would imagine some of my lectures on Marcus Aurelius would pop up in, in Google. Um, so I, 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 I'm not as big on Marcus as I am on Epictetus and Seneca. Um, I think they're more important to read. It's unfortunate that, like, Aurelius is the go-to person for so many, like, you know, beginner Stoics, um, because I, I think, you know, I think that that's in part because of the popularity of Ian Holiday and his constantly talking about Aurelius. And I think it's also because Aurelius is like kind of all scattered all over the map. And so you can like just pick and choose things rather than reading more systematic treatises by Epictetus and, and Seneca. So... But I think Epictetus and Seneca really go much deeper into things. 
All right. Uh, just skipped a little bit. Let's see. What do we got here? Um. <laughs> Abimanu, I find people insulting philosophy a lot. Why? Well, a lot of people are assholes and ignorant to begin with, right? So we got that side over here. A lot of philosophers are assholes and, and you know, talk down to people and, uh, you know, uh, you know, espouse positions and then, you know, look at you with a blank stare. So, you know, it's easy to hate people like that. And a lot of people also read things out of context. And, you know, there's also philosophers who bash other philosophers. Think about like Karl Popper and his stupid, stupid read on, on Plato. Um, and then, you know, you, well, you read Karl Popper, well, he, he must be right. He's a philosopher, right? So Plato must be a bad guy, right? Or think of Ayn Rand, you know. Uh, Ayn Rand is a, a, an enemy of Plato and a proponent of Aristotle. But her Aristotle is like totally, you know, well, it's not totally wrong. It's not, it's not possible to get something totally wrong. But it's clearly not Aristotle, right? Um, so, you know, I, I'd say philosophers contribute to that. And, you know, the the uh, disdain that a lot of people have for the humanities in general is probably part of that. So um, let's see here. Ridicule. Do you think some sort of global governance cosmopolitanism is necessary to deal with the scale of today's problems? That's the, the, the thing that sucks. Probably yes. And it ain't going to happen. So, you know, we can't even get our crap together here in this country, the United States, which is like the giant, tra you know, going around busting everything up. We can't even get things work right you know, so that we can like fight COVID or deal with climate crisis, which clearly is happening. Um, how's the world going to do it? <laughs> you know? So sounds kind of rough to say that. Uh, Russell Henry Bieber, have you ever, have you read Gravity's Rainbow or do you plan to? Haven't and don't plan to. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people love it, but I got better stuff to do with my time. There's so many other books for me to read, you know. Uh, Tobias, are you a Christian? If so, are there some key thinkers that were decisive for it? Are there some key thinkers that are almost worth being Christian for? Yeah, you know, I am a Christian and I will say something that I've said before. I find most interesting the thinkers for whom being or becoming Christian did not solve all their problems, but rather made their world more rich and complicated and spurred them to doing a lot more work. Somebody who I've been shooting videos on this last week, Augustine, the Confessions, because I'm teaching a medieval philosophy class um, that, that just started recently at Carthage College. I mean... Becoming a Christian did not like shrink his worldview. It actually expanded it, you know. Um, Gabriel Marcel, another another convert, right? A lot of times these converts. Um, Chesterton uh, explicitly frames this in his Orthodoxy. Um, he, you know, there's almost like a proof for God's existence there that is based on like the world becoming richer by actually entertaining the hypothesis. Kierkegaard, Blondell, you know, all, a lot of these thinkers, uh, and some, um, somebody I do a lot of work on, you know. Um, so there's there's tons and tons of interesting Christian thinkers. Um, Lactantius is somebody I'm a fan of. You know, he's got these writings, this book on divine anger, which actually tells us a lot about human anger, where he also considers the positions of the Platonists, Aristotelians, Epicureans, and Stoics, right? I like that stuff where it's really... It's not just some Bible thumper saying dumb shit because he's read a verse here or there. It's like people who are engaging the world, engaging other people, understanding themselves, trying to make sense out of this this crazy thing that we call God that doesn't just you know make everything simple and, and clear. That's that's the kind of stuff I'm I'm actually attracted to. All right. Um, Eli says, I'm a beginner to philosophy taking a class on Hegel, Dominal Spirit. You poor bastard. It's so difficult. I haven't been able to fully comprehend a single paragraph. Should I drop the class and build up my philosophical repertoire before coming back to Hegel? Yeah, probably so. I mean, 
And when you come back to Hegel, don't start with the phenomenology of spirits. Start with the lectures on the philosophy of history and the lectures on the history of philosophy. Start with a book where he names names and makes a lot easier for you. Um, I don't know why anyone would, would, would tell you to start with the phenomenology of spirit. That is like... Um, you know, you've never driven a car before and they're going to put you into a, you know, a uh, Formula One race, you know, or you've never actually played football before and you get drafted to the NFL and you're going to be, you know, an inside linebacker. That's just not going to work. So, yeah, I mean, Hegel's tough. Um, Hegel is pretty high up there in difficulty level. Um, that's what I would say. So, let's see. <laughs> Muzzle paint, you are the ace of spades. That's very nice. Uh, oops, just skipped a little bit. Um, in Search of Great Books, what are your favorite essays by Edgar? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I mean, I teach uh, to undergraduates as the introduction to Heidegger, what is metaphysics? I think that's a great essay. I think it's got a lot of the key themes that Heidegger works through, works with throughout his career in like a little capsule form. So that's, that's a good one. Um, on the essence of truth, I think is really important. Um, you know, um, I'm not as big on the later Heidegger stuff, except maybe the question concerning technology. Um, I also like Heidegger's lectures on, on things. I think that those are a great resource for understanding Heidegger's thought and for understanding what it is that he's lecturing on. So he's got like a great set of discussions of, I mean, he's got like four, four volume of lectures on Nietzsche, which I think are quite good. Um, he's got discussions of like Plato's cave and, you know, Aristotle on affectivity and, you know, phenomenology of the religious life. There's all sorts of really cool stuff. And it's all been, uh, I don't know, it's all been, most of it's been translated recently. So that's pretty cool. Um, here we go. Diogenes, do you think Heidegger was right to consider the poetical or art as techne being the correct way to figure out the essence of technology or its saving power? I think he's right. Uh, to consider it an a way. I mean, there's multiple ways to understand technology. Um, Max, thanks for your work. I'm reading Plato's Parmenides for a metaphysics class. Do you have some things about the content I should keep in mind as I'm reading? Yeah, I mean, there's basically two parts to Plato's Parmenides, right? There's the, the easily readable, hey, Parmenides, old guy. Hey, Socrates, young guy. How's that uh, you know, view of the forms coming along to you? Hey, Zeno, what are you up to? They, they go back and forth and chit chat. That's, that's cool stuff right there. And then we got this crazy dialectic thing. Uh, and it's I've never really fully understood what the hell's supposed to be going on in the rest of the Parmenides myself. It's for me, it's always been something you just kind of work your way through and hope that you get something out of it. So I, I don't have a lot to, to contribute about that, unfortunately. Um, let's try to take a few that we haven't uh, answered already from other people. Um, do, do, let's see who I haven't had before. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is a great one from Adam Hegemon. I started reading Nietzsche, and it's making me wish I hadn't because it seems correct, and I hate him for it. How do I balance his thoughts with that of the philosophers and, and the antiquity? You don't. You, you, you read your way through it. Without it. Just, you know, work on one thing at a time. And, you know, so what if you find yourself attracted to it? You're, are you finished with your philosophical development? Are you going to, like, go out and start, you know, preaching Nietzsche on the street because of this? Probably not. So, you know, there's not a ton riding on this. Um, and which philosophers of antiquity? Nietzsche is pretty receptive to Aristotle, for example, and pretty hostile to Plato um, or to the Stoics, right? So it's not just the philosophers of antiquity. Um, there's, there's actually, you know, a rather complex field. Um, I wouldn't worry about it too much. 
Uh, this is this is kind of what happens when you study philosophy and you do so for the first time with a particular figure. You start to see the world their way. Do it long enough, and some doubts will creep in, and um, you know you'll start to engage in critique of them and say, "Well, wait a second, Nietzsche, where are you getting this from?" You know. Um, Let's see. Uh, Ashmar, is the gutting of philosophy and the liberal arts overall due to a general public devaluation of things that don't generate capital? Has America become far less introspective? Both what's going on? Neither. It's, it, this is a, a trend that's been going on for a very long time. It's just, it just so happens that the universities work kind of, you know, imperfect oases from from that. And they've been, I mean, you could say that it's part of the capitalist process, you know, uh, universities have in effect become uh, gutted and colonized by um, all these concerns and by having you know, boards of trustees who are people and stuff like that and hiring, hiring managers essentially for, for administrators rather than having people rise up from, from the uh, ranks of the professorate. Um, but this is not something radically new. There, there, people have been talking about the waning of the academy the entire 20th century and 21st, right? So it, it doesn't have just one cause either. Uh, Hookie says, I'm currently reading Schopenhauer for a module at uni and your Kant series really helped me understand the critique. Any advice in understanding Schopenhauer? Yeah, I, I do have a few things. Any Anytime that he mentions Hegel, just ignore that. He's a sourpuss and he's off base when it comes to Hegel and he's got some, you know, psychological, uh, uh, what would you call it, a thorn in his side that's, that's making him say stupid things. Um, Schopenhauer is taking Kant really, really seriously. And he's also taking Plato seriously. And he's trying to bring all these other things together. He's also taking the philosophy of sympathy quite seriously, as you can see in his works. So it, it, it doesn't hurt to not just read Kant, but also like bone up on Plato and, and you know, um, some of these other figures as well. Um, I mean, the same thing can happen to you, like, uh, who is it that was just talking about Nietzsche? Uh, at Agamemnon, where you read Schopenhauer and eventually you like almost take on his point of view. That's okay. You'll, you'll probably come out of it. Um, but if you don't, you'll be in good company because there's many of other people who, who have done that. Uh, Ed to Darwin, our dream experiences of metaphysical issues. So is there any literature on the matter? There is a vast literature going back to antiquity about dreams. Um, and you could probably just Google it and find all sorts of sources. Can it be a metaphysical issue? Yeah. What's going on in dreams? <laughs> What's happening? Are these images in some respect real or are they just, you know, phantasmata, you know, images that we, we produce? What, what do dreams actually mean? These are all sorts of metaphysical issues, I'd say. Um, Maxwell, what do you think of Protestantism as a Catholic? I don't. I don't think as a Catholic, and I don't think of Protestantism because that names, at this point in time, over 10,000 different denominations. That's the sort of like big picture, everything is everything thinking that I don't really do. So, um, and I would, I would discourage others from doing that as well. We're getting close to the time when I'm going to have to go get some lunch, um, but let's see what else we, we have. Um, what are your thoughts on newer writers posting or publishing their works on websites like Wattpad or whatnot? Great. Yeah. I mean, uh, post stuff wherever you want to. Um, you might run into some jerks. Um, and you know, I, I look at a few things on, on Wattpad over the years. Um, I, I, I don't know how you find quality stuff in it. It seems like it's just like a big tub of things, right? But yeah, it can't hurt, right? I, I suppose you might have to worry about people plagiarizing you. That that could be a concern. So um, let's see. Efron, have you read any mysticism? What do you think of mysticism and do you believe in God? 
Yeah, I've read plenty of mystics. Um, I think that, you know, there's like real mysticism and then there's bullshit, new agey, feel good mysticism. And they're two very different things. I think somebody claims to be a mystic. The first thing I want to ask them is, okay, what do you actually mean by that? And if all they can do is kind of circle around the topic with like, oh man, like, you know, the stuff that I, I, I feel and I have this, you know, unique insight. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. You're bullshit. You know, I, I don't ever want to waste any more time with you. If it's somebody who's like, hey, um, I've got these insights and I'm trying to communicate them. I'm doing the best I can and I'm not dismissing anybody else and trying to place myself above other people. Okay, that, that's more interesting to me. Um, all right. Uh, Tullius, you're always looking for practical insights from the people you read. What practical insights have you taken away from and or implemented from Heidegger? Um, I think he's right that, you know, in, in his discussion of the four equi primordials, I think that's actually brilliant from being in time, um, that mood affectivity does, have, um, pre-understanding is articulated through language does flow from our, our thrownness and stuff like that. I think that's, that's actually quite brilliant. Um, you know, there are varieties of what he calls nihilative behavior, I think he's right about that too, you know? So those are some right there. And, you know, the, the need to like slow down, pay attention, see what's actually being unconcealed. Don't expect everything to be unconcealed at once. I think that, that's that's good advice too. Um, let's see. Ask, das, das, das something, something. Do you feel Chinese philosophers bring different concepts to Western ones, or are there many overlaps in that aspect? Um, the dot, like the Tao of Lao Tzu, Zhuangzi, or Mengzi. Um, there's lots of overlaps, and there should be, because we're all rational beings growing up in different systems. And then sometimes later on, when there's connections, actual connections between Western and Chinese philosophy from the time, really, of the Jesuits being there, uh, exerting some influence, uh, these culture spheres are connected with each other. Um, there should be lots and lots of overlaps. And, um, you know, we should avoid easy identifications. Confucius isn't Aristotle, right? Even though they, they both have a mean, right? Um, but, you know, there's, there's interconnections. And we'd be silly to think that, like, East is so different from West. No, I mean, both of them have similar things going on. And that's just Chinese and, and, and what we call Western philosophy. Indian philosophy, entirely different cultural sphere, right? Not It's not that there's Eastern philosophy that's Chinese lumped into the same thing as Indian, as Islamic, which is, a, you know, in a, in a middle area as well. So, all right. Let's see if I can take one more. We're, we're already over a, a little bit over time. Um, do, do, do. Frederick Walzer, are we really rational beings? Yes. And you're engaging in rationality and even raising the question and expecting an answer. Are we pure, purely rational beings? Are we completely rational beings? No. Rationality involves a process of purifying that very rationality that we often do with. Right? But that is part of our nature. And are we the only rational beings? Maybe not. Maybe um, some of the higher animals participate in rationality in ways that previous philosophers didn't want to acknowledge. You know, we've got like human beings on one side and then all the other animals on the other. Maybe the cetaceans and, uh, you know, octopi and, and, you know, corvids and elephants and higher apes and stuff like that. Um, maybe they participate in rationality. You know, that's, that's something to think about. But yeah, we are, we are rational beings. So that's, that's a fitting place to end. I'll say thanks to everybody for their questions, ideas, comments. Uh, good AMA once again. I got to go and get some, some food in my belly before I meet with my uh, Patreon supporters for philosophy chat. And then start uh, this afternoon. I got a full slate of shooting videos on the confessions scheduled for my medieval class, which you will eventually see as they 
they come out as I release them. Right now I'm in the process of finishing up with my last Earthsea books and, and events like this. So, all right, I'll see all of you somewhere else in the ether.